Greetings each and every one and more people are coming over this so uh, should have been earlier but life is life and we're having a good time here on the festival and enjoying ourselves and taking times you know so yeah this is gonna be what we call the dub talk uh, we got our the man the legend himself Nick Manasse if that's your real last name probably not no. I know, I know. With us, uh, and it's gonna be some echoes and memories of the late great Josh Shaka, who we sadly, as everyone here knows, lost too early, not to say. Uh, and after that, maybe we're gonna have some Q&A, some questions, uh, and yeah. Nick, uh, you can begin whenever you feel like and read some to us. We wait in eagerly. <laughs> It's like story time. It's quite long. Yeah. It's probably like about 15 minutes or something. Uh, okay. So I'm very grateful to... Um, the festival Escape the City for making me actually do this to write something about Shaka because I wanted to do it when we heard the news in uh, April that I think it was April that Shaka had died and um, you know I like I like to do a bit of writing but I just was not doing it so it's nice that the uh, festival uh, was the catalyst for me uh, sitting down and um, thinking about Shaka, who died, um, as was just said, really before before his right time. I think he was 70 when he passed away. So here we go, Shaka, a personal meditation. It was all about the night buses. There weren't that many back in 1986, so you needed to time it right. It was, I think, the N207 from Shepherd's Bush to Trafalgar Square, which was the night bus hub at that time, and then the N12 to Peckham. The trick that me and my mate Jeremy wanted to pull off was to get to Shaka in Mellon Road at about two o'clock in the morning, and that way we'd get a couple of hours of him playing records before the dub plate started at about four. As I remember it, you went down a little dead-end alley just off the high street and up a metal staircase to a first floor, totally anonymous, following the sound from the top of the street. 300 people and it would have been rammed out. As it was, there was probably 120 people in there, everybody moving, the big dreads stepping up front by the control tower. The new Shaka Productions at that time that I remember hearing first in Mellon Road were Judge Our Way by Sister Naya and Joe Works by Vivian Jones. Although totally underground and probably illegal in terms of licensing and safety, the dances were always well run and disciplined. I personally never saw any trouble at a Shaka session. There was always good Ital food we often used to eat at Shaka, and although the vibe was serious and militant as a young white kid, I never once felt unwelcome in those early days. We'd started going to Shaka regularly a few years before in 1983 or 84, southeast London usually, Deptford, Peckham and New Cross, St. Mark's, Arklow Road, The Moonshot and Mellon Road in West London, Metro in Labrick Grove, and a wicked hall in Harlesden. I can't remember the name of it, but it had a beautiful semicircle arch ceiling. St. Mark's was a proper old church, vaulted roof and everything. Shaka sounded different in each venue. One I really liked was the Seven Ladies Club in North London, because it was smaller with a low ceiling and a long but narrow room where Shaka played on the, w on the wide side and we were all around him. Let Ja In, Twinkle Brothers, was a big tune I remember from there. The sound was close and direct, no reverb. But all of these ven venues suited Shaka's sound in different ways. Maybe Moonshot was the best because I, because I remember it like an irregular space, no parallel walls and an angled ceiling. 
oddly, I can't remember going to Shaka in East London proper in the 80s because I wonder if there was worries about badness. There certainly was with some other sounds. Shaka didn't sound like other sounds. Most other sounds in London played nice, just right, like Jamaican sounds. But Shaka's sound was about overdrive and a more extreme EQ. Even when he wasn't fully pushing the sound, there was always a good bit of what my inner engineer would now call harmonic distortion and holes in the frequency spectrum. Very strong from about 80 hertz to 120 hertz for the bass, about 700 hertz to 7K for the mids and tops, not so much in between. But this made Shaka's sound exciting and dread. We like a bit of distortion and it made the tune sound different, not just loud. Oh man, sounded wicked on Shaka last night, we'd be saying. It made you see a heavyweight warrior side to a tune that maybe the producers hadn't even seen or intended. Shaka played quite a few tunes with Lover's lyrics, if they were in a minor key. And of course, he did push the sound. Shaka could rass it up like no other sound, and though I can't speak definitively, no other sounds that I knew did push it like Shaka. It was part of his style, a combination of his personality, the speaker boxes, and early 1970s electronics. I've played on sounds run by valve amps. Of course, there's a million variables, but there is a thing about the way big valve amps do bass. It's about compression and harmonics. All the notes in the bass come out more evenly, emphasizing the line. Musically, the unique thing about Shaka was that every single tune he played was in a minor key except once at St. Mark's when he surprised everyone by playing Cool It Amigo by the Ethiopians, a sweet and funny tune, big smiles. It might have been because the tune had recently come around again on a Treasure Isle seven inch, the other side of the whip, and he just grabbed it because the tune before was running out. I don't know, I wasn't looking, but it shows how unusual it was that I remember it nearly 40 years later. No idea of what the tunes before and after were. But that was the thing, no other sounds did this. The opposite, in fact. With most other sounds, you'd be lucky to get more than a couple of militant-style minor key tunes in a night, by the 80s anyway, more, I think, in the late 70s. So the minors set the tone. It was serious, militant, and rasta, urban rasta. Looking back now, I can see more clearly than in my youth how this London version of Rastafari was created, was not created, but conditioned by many, by many years of societal, state, and institutional racism and exclusion, police brutality and economic hardship. The result, true for all that first generation of black Afro-Caribbean UK sound systems, a self-help movement, a form of protection and belonging, an affront united against oppression. Not for nothing were the three or four famous streets of confrontation in London called the line or the front line. Shaka created a whole culture around him. People were and still are obsessed with the legendary dub plates, Gates of Zion, Michael Prophet, the Prince Mohammed cut of the Pablo Steppers tune with the flute line, I never knew the title the Al Campbell tune he played against us with the Dread Horns line. I've been told what that one's called, but I can't remember. How could I forget the unreleased Johnny Clark classic, Give I the Power? And of course, the now anthemic classic. Uh, and of course, the now anthemic Kunta Kinte, a one-away dub of Earth and Stones, Beware of Your Enemies. A whole lingua was invented. A shaka tune, shaka style, shaka play that. You go in Shaka tonight, Guan Shaka, the Shaka coach. You can ask me about that later. I have dub plates from other sound systems of the past that say one cut Shaka style, handwritten to describe cut four on a 10 inch dub plate of four different tunes. Shaka had certain areas musically where he was strong. Yabby Yu and Bunny Lee Productions, and of course all the UK producers, especially Stafford from Arts and Crafts label, Dennis Bavell and Mr. Fraser himself, the great mad professor. 
Many other sounds were more focused on Jamaica, and I would say that Shaka's support for UK reggae productions, and much later as they started to come, productions from all over the world, from day one all the way till now, was crucial for the growing industry and its wider recognition, and I am personally grateful for that. Nothing will ever touch how I felt when my friend told me that Shaka played Seventh Seal for the first time. Three pull-ups, madness in the dance. Another big part of that culture was about sound tapes. This covered the whole sound system arena from Jamaica to New York to the UK. Everybody listened to sound tapes, but Shaka tapes were big. They were kind of addictive. I knew a lot of people okay, mainly guys, if I'm honest, who only listened to sound tapes. They were good for getting the dance hall excitement, sometimes more so than when you're actually at the dance because they left something to the imagination. The classic example of this was when the tapes came around from a dance in Leicester, Jatubbies and Shaka. The tapes were insane, monstrous. Tubbies did some serious damage with a Johnny Clark special, Shaka, as always when under pressure, came back in full magnificent style, blazing a Michael Prophet dub. The crowd letting off. We were going crazy listening to the tapes. I heard a year or so later that actually there were only about 30 people at the dance and it was a bit of a flop. <laughs> <laughs> In 1987, Selwyn from Shaka's crew got in touch and asked us to play with Shaka in Hackney, Darnley Road. As you can imagine, aged between 20 and 21 as we were, and having had a sound for less than two years, this was quite a big deal. Many visits to Jat Hubbies to cut dubs followed and the excitement grew in our camp. The day came, we were there first and playing by the time Shaka and his crew arrived. I remember getting a big grin from one of the young dreads who was stringing up as I played new JA releases. The vibe was good and the dance was full. We had my friend Bunny on the mic and the veteran sound man Natty Frontline was with us overseeing proceedings and occasionally feeding me Black Uhuru dub plates. We did okay. We got some appreciation for some new sound duration dubs. Some of Tubby's crew said we booted Shaka. We definitely didn't but we held our ground. Shaka played hard and blazing, as good as I ever heard him play. I remember that Al Campbell dub and sirens, Shaka chanting, delays and a classic pull up. Organic, the whole thing coming together like one raging animal, a lion, obviously. We played Shaka again in 1989 in Southall, West London at Chagas Hall. Naptali from Reading put on the dance. I think it might have been the first time I spoke to Shaka as we were stringing up. He was really great, in a good mood. We had some technical problems that night, but the dance was still great, though with one major exception, it was much more Shaka's night as our sound wasn't 100%. Apologies to those who know this story, which I've told many times, but for me, the great event of the night came about because Shaka had a white label of our new Sound Aeration album. He didn't know that it was our music. Back to back, he played CTUFB and Satellite and completely destroyed the dance. People, people going crazy, but it was Manasseh selection. For some reason, in our box, I had a tune called Ja Children Cry by Sister Audrey, and I happened to know that this was Shaka's first release on his label. So I reached for it and played it to some odd looks from people, as it's not a typical Shaka tune. But I think Shaka got the message. And th though I never knew him very well personally, we were always very friendly after that whenever we met. There was one time at Belgrade on an island in the River Danube featuring an enormous snake on stage. But that's another story. In the 90s, Shaka moved to a different level in terms of his reach and the scale of the dances. Through his work with our friend Nikki Ezer from Culture Promotions, Shaka began to play to audiences far removed from the old school London faithful. His, faith, his fame increased dramatically and by 2020, going to Shaka 
had become a thing experienced by many thousands of people outside the UK. In fact, Shaka's final dance was in Paris, which is fitting in some ways, as France has embraced Shaka's particular take on sound system culture, probably more widely than any other European country. As I said in Hanover on the rattle tone sound in my first dance after Shaka moved on, none of us would be standing in this room right now if it hadn't been for the power and influence of one man, just Shaka. This is also true here and now. There are dub sounds all over the world these days, and pretty much all of them come from Shaka. One deck, up high, preamps and sirens. Other sounds played like this back in the day, but with Shaka it became iconic. And so the thing is spread, the Shaka thing. For every 10 people who go to a good sound system dance, one or two will leave with a, a seed planted in their souls. They may not follow a sound rigorously or plan journeys on night buses like we used to, but they'll always carry and recognize that feeling and be better people. I believe that this movement owes everything to this black youth from southeast London, a child of what is now called in the UK the Windrush generation, after the first ship bringing migrants from the Caribbean to work in a country depleted and depressed after two world wars. The reaction all over the world to Shaka's passing has been amazing. On the evening of the day I heard Shaka died, it didn't take too long on my phone to see the extent of the international media coverage. The Daily Nation in Pakistan had the brilliant headline, UK sound system legend Jashaka dies, followed by the line, who is Jashaka? <laughs> I just looked again. He's in the Telegraph, for God's sake, the right-wing establishment newspaper in the UK, for those who don't know. It matters because you don't get that kind of response if something that you spent your life doing didn't have weight to it, if it hadn't sunk in a bit at least. Speaking to South African students in June 1966, Bobby Kennedy said, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest wall of oppression and resistance. I don't think that Shaka started out back in 1970 expecting to change or challenge musical and cultural attitudes, but there's no doubt that for very many people in the world, whether from direct experience or from the echoes and the ripples, he did just that. It's ridiculous to try to compare or to try to rank heroes. Shaka is not the same as Mandela, but he was and will remain a hero. In public, he did and he chanted more than he talked. He transmitted energy and integrity and he represented something strong and noble to people. Friends used to call him Noki. I'm told this because his knees used to knock together when he was young. Noki Simeon, born in the month of May. It's funny because after years and years of filling out PRS forms, Gamer or Sassem in Europe, I know the legal names of many reggae artists. Buju Banton is Mark Myrie. Luciano has the excellent name of Jephtha McClymont. <laughs> and Bunny Whaler was Neville Livingston. But with Shaka, after all these years and all those bus journeys, I never knew his name. Thank you, Nick. That was beautiful, to say the least. Yeah. If anybody does know Shaka's legal name, please don't tell me. Yeah. Well. I was really moved. I was into into the story, like really, really. But Thank you. yeah, I, I would like maybe to go for some questions regarding maybe you, maybe Shaka. So we don't like stretch it out forever. We got Whatever you like to attend. So sorry, I couldn't hear. I couldn't. I could not not take notes here. Uh, 
basically what you said about like minor keys and yeah. i know that like shaka had like this connection i think is one of his talks where he showed like some black spiritual songs which are always written in minor keys and that was like really really his thing in, in that sense do you have like maybe some some insight as a musical producer for over 40 years why that would be the case with reggae and uh, especially with shaka styles and do you use it like or, or in your own productions uh yeah it's a, it's a good question i mean i think one thing one thing that i can say is that Shaka would have grown up with, you know, being the age he was and coming from a West Indian background, he would have grown up with ska music, yeah. um, a lot of, you know, all kinds of all kinds of music. And you know, if you look at, you know, Jamaican music from the sixties, um, the sixties, it's it's it, you know, it's mainly it's pretty kind of happy and happy and sexy, and you know, it's not that kind of dread minor yeah, key yeah, thing in, but in the 70s, it? so at some point you know i'm just it's just logical shaka must have made it made a decision that this dread minor key militant thing this is for me because all other sounds it varied it you know they would play some but they would also play you know other you know lovers rock and all, all kinds of music you know um, it, it, you know, I can't say that it was like literally 100% no other sounds did that because I, you know, there were, we used to play with smaller sounds who played in the Shaka style, you know, even in the eighties, but certainly Shaka pushed that, you know, that, uh, so he, all I'm saying is that at some point he must've, he must've thought this is, this is for me, this is where I'm at, you know, this, this militant thing. Yeah, um, set the stage, set the blueprint, as you eloquently yeah. put it together yeah. for something that has, as you can see, yeah, come even to is. those godforsaken lands we call our home, you know. Yeah. Who would have thought, like, Shaka seriously, you know, but even you, I mean, if you look at it that way, <coughs> back in, like, 86, 87, where you visited the dancers, did you ever think, like, that things are going to take it till here? I mean, Japan, all over the world, Croatia, and whatever in that no. style. No idea, no <laughs> idea that that you know. I mean, that there was going to be. I mean, I played. I played on a wicked sound system in sh in Tokyo. You know, yeah. I, I would not have thought that in 1985 or whatever. I would not have guessed that I was going to play, you know, Shaka style music in Moscow and Tokyo and Bangkok and you know. I just yeah. I I I, you know. People don't really think like that. I think know. Shaka had a foresight, if you know the tune in Rasta Deja, you know? Oh when yeah. he says, I think, like, if you go to Yugoslavia, Rasta Deja. Yeah. And it was so. Yeah. Can I ask you, what is the Shaka coach? Okay, the Shaka coach was um, a thing that uh, Shaka used to play often in Northampton. And Northampton is one of those... Um, towns in the UK it's about halfway between London and Birmingham maybe nearer nearer to Birmingham but always a big um, West Indian community and Shaka would would play in the MFM club and um, yeah there, there, there was a Shaka coach you could get the coach from London yeah it was like to, 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 go, to go to the dance and that was the Shaka coach um, I think also yeah maybe sometimes they would they would book a coach to go to Reading um, I remember sometimes you'd be at the dance going, yeah, the coach is leaving 10 minutes. You know, everybody had to, everybody who was on the coach had to leave the dance. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Like, really an institution to say so, like in the community. And I know you mentioned it, but like the first clash with Shaka uh, and allegedly Abba Shanti was it, or who said that you really mushed up his ass. Oh, I didn't want to say it was Abba ah, Shanti. Ah, come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he did say that, yeah, <laughs> he did, yeah, yeah. but we didn't, we did we didn't, it, I think the thing is, is that we didn't, we didn't get completely whooped, you know, um, the, the, you know. Stood your ground, didn't we it? We stood our ground. Yes, yeah, that's it. Can I, like, shift the focus back a bit yeah. to you, like, in case somebody does not know, but I mate Nick is over 40 years almost in the business, I would say, yeah. from 80, 85-ish, I mean, you started with, like, Kiss FM, 
and not started, but you were also part of that pirate radio station thing. Yeah. Yeah. And can I just like cut it? It's a thing that almost strictly UK or even a London thing, which wasn't like that much spread all over Europe. So maybe if you could bring uh, the idea of pirate radio and why oh, was it yeah. so important closer to our beloved audience yeah. here? Yeah. 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 Um, it's good. Yeah. Why? Why was there not pirate radio? In Europe, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe things were a bit more liberal. Maybe it was easier to get a license. Um, but yeah, pirate radio was massive in the 80s and even now, up to up to now. Um, and it's um, yeah. I mean, it, I, I, I can't give you a, a coherent kind of. Um, a little paragraph about it, but one thing I will say is that there is a definite relationship between the guys who used to make the transmitters and the guys who would make sound system equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's underground electronics, you know. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. Making a tra making a radio transmitter is not that difficult. Um, so, and obviously, every time you are busted, you're going to lose one. Um, so you had to, you know, they had to churn out, they had to make the transistor, the transmitters quickly. Um, we started chronologically for us, I think the, the, we finished our sound in, in Carnival 1985. Uh, in February 1987, I came back from Jamaica and, um, uh, yeah, we found out that that they wanted us to do a late night slot on Kiss FM. Could you could you maybe like describe if I understood it correctly? What is like a flat or something? Yeah, it was a flat. Absolutely. A, uh, transmitter. Hundred percent. Really? It, no, it was in, it was in people's people's um, bedrooms. In fact, for the last year of illegal Kiss FM, I I had been given the keys to a council flat in East London and I rented out my spare room to Kiss FM for the last year of its illegal broadcasting and I lived off that 30 pounds a week that that um, Gordon Mack from Kiss FM gave me and there was one there was one funny story where um, very clever tactics by the police is that what they do is they knock on your door and you open the door, you open, they knock on the door, and you open the door into the police, and they go, oh, good evening, so would you mind if we come and had a quick chat? And before you know it, they're in. They're in, and they must have looked at me and thought, he's probably got some ganja or something. You know, if he knows, if he knows something, we'll be able to twist his arm, and he, he'll tell us everything he knows. Because in my block in East London, they'd found a body, and the, 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 this is some white gangster. He looked exactly like Phil from EastEnders. If you know, no, probably none of you know what I mean by that. A um, cultural thing, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I didn't know anything about the body in the in the garages downstairs. I was I, I, I was nothing to do with that. But <laughs> if the police had turned, they they went straight ahead into my little front room. If they would turned right, they would have gone into the Kiss FM studio. <laughs> and. Uh, but um, yeah, it was in it was in people's houses. You would broadcast with a with a, a thing called a microlink, so that the transmitter. My place was ideal because it was 16, 16 stories in a big London tower block, and um, so you had a microlink which broadcast a little signal to the main transmitter that was in another block, and then your monitor in the studio was the radio. So if the radio went off, if your monitor went off in the studio, that would mean that you were busted and you had to stop playing very quickly because once they busted the transmitter, they could then track the micro link signal and they would have been there quick. It's, it's amazing yeah. what people did before the internet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Nick the man. I mean, I mean, the whole story about pirate radio stations, especially like in these parts, is virtually 
an unknown phenomena of like why, how, and where, but you were really a part of it. And yeah. I mean, Kiss FM since that became sort of legendary from that little slot and onwards. Well, it went it went it went legal, so yes, we had yes. to stop. We had to stop broadcasting as a pirate because we couldn't apply for the license while we were still broadcasting illegally. So then we stopped, and then we got the license in the summer of 1990. Man. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll jump to one thing. Uh, we were the colonized and stuff like that. You being in the 80s, we probably some of your mains the really white minority that were on the dances. And the way it kind of twisted and turned and became some really, really multicultural thing in the end. Like nowadays, you see as many black as white faces, as many as Indian youths, Asian youths, and everywhere. Like, when did the change start? Like, in the 90s, something like that, or what was the spark that made it happen? So it drew a much multicultural crowd, especially when you talk about Shaka sessions, they always drew a multicultural crowd in that way. Yeah, I'll tell you, I mean, I said it in the thing. I, yeah. I think a lot of it I can um, attribute to to my, my old friend, uh, Nikki Eza from Culture Promotions, and she, she took Shaka out of his kind of comfort zone and she started putting on dances at the rocket uh which was in holloway road in north london and when when shaka died there was a lot of um tributes came in from you know people big djs who are not reggae djs um you know and they used to go to the rocket that's where they first checked shaka and um i, th I think it was that i think that was the that was the big change nikki did two things she started to have Shaka playing in different and new areas and also she started the original dub club um and um that was that was really key you know that 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 was a, that was a big deal so you know was it just an organic thing i th i think it's um i think it's a bit more than that um i think you could also look at the um, what was happening in other music at the same time. You know, it was the sort of um, 1988 was the summer of Acid House and yeah, yeah. raving and people, you know, maybe people just started to kind of open up a bit, you know, and there was definitely in in those those sessions at the Rocket, it was a bit ravey. You know, if, I, if I'm brutally honest, some of the kind of the old hardcore was like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's not the same, not the same as it was when there was only a hundred of us, you know, yeah, and it yeah. was, you know, but... It was great, you know. It was great, but and certainly the certainly the um, obviously there's a relationship between the steppers thing and kind of rave music, just in terms of the bass drum, you know. Um, yeah, and the dance until yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the whole introspection uh, uh, of the dance itself in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Nick. Considering you being. Yeah, um, senior citizen almost now. Yeah, to, to yeah, to yeah nearly so. get my free bus pass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Production, yeah. production, production. How did you learn the craft? I mean, um, I read somewhere you play the flute. Actually, is that true? I did. I did. I did. I played. <laughs> I, 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 the flute was my schoolboy instrument, and a little bit of classical guitar. Um, I. Um, yeah, I I, th I just kind of um, I, I I sort of figured it out. It's like, well, it it must be like that, you know. You might, I mean, everybody knows what a mixing desk looks like, you know. It must be that one instrument comes up on one channel, and and then um, yeah, it was funny. It was it was actually a landlord in the flat where I was living in West London. Sort of said, oh, my friends have a studio, you know, they'll help you, and um, I was like, okay. I'll, I'll I'll book a bit of studio time and just see what happens, and um, yeah, actually no, I think Jatubbies was the first one. Anyway, to be honest, you pick it up, you pick it up, and I've got that kind of mind, you know. I, I've sort of I can store stupid amounts of detail, and um, uh, uh, and um, yeah, I, I think um, the the physical production side of it is not you know it's not rocket science you can you, you know you can learn it 
Um, yeah, as rock and scientists say, come on, it's not music production. You can <laughs> yeah. learn it. Yeah. Like in the same way. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you have to have a certain state of mind for that. Uh, I've al I always loved music. You know, I always, always, always loved music. I remember when I was about seven years old or something, my, my, um, I remember my parents took me to, um, to see Mozart's Requiem which I then became obsessed with that piece of music. I'm still obsessed with it, actually. I, can, I still know all the words to the Dies Irae. Um, uh, and I remember noticing at that concert, I remember saying to my mum, it's like, wow, there's a rhythm. If you tap your feet, the next note will come on that rhythm. And she was like, going, yeah, yeah, that's rhythm. And I thought, wow. You know, I mean, yeah, I'm musical. It's in my family. I've, I've got it everywhere, all over my family. What's the first album that you bought yourself? This uh, record. Ooh. Ooh. X, uh, the specials. The first Either album? the specials or X-ray specs. Can't remember. Um, but yes. for sure, as I, I always say, for a lot of white kids of my generation, um, it all came at the same time. The specials, the clash, and then the sort of hangover from the kind of the, the reggae scar skinheads, not the racist skinheads, but the reggae yeah. scar ones, that the, all the Trojan music was popular again. And don't forget, you know, we're talking, so we're talking about like 1979, well, Israelites, Desmond Decker, was number one in, uh, in the charts in 1970. Yeah, so yeah. it's not that long before, you know. Um, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, those 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 um, the specials are a really key key band. Yeah, I mean we lost also Terry Hall recently, yeah. which was also a great shame yeah. and really a pivotal figure. Also with Jerry Demis, of course, who was yeah. the mastermind behind them. Yeah. I mean, good choice of records. Also yeah. with X Ray <laughs> Specs. Yeah. Um, yeah. While we at records, you produced the seminal album, The Equalizer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, could you tell me a bit more about that? It's actually a question from Alex over there, so big up Sandra Kanaifai. Ah, oh, okay, nice. Musical nice. thing. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, so the equalizer is Jeremy, who I referred to in the, who, who was my, uh, my sort of, um, well, there was a little crew of um, kids who, who would all meet at Shaka, but Jeremy was the one who lived near me, and um, Jeremy was, the, is, was and is still the equalizer. Um, and you know what? It was just doing tunes. Yeah. It was just doing tunes. Buy a tape. Go, go, go up to the West End, buy a half-inch tape. Do some music. Smoke a lot of ganja. Um, and um, yeah, just do, doing tunes. Um, the, we put it out originally on our own label, Riz, um, that, that I ran with... Um, my friend uh, Gil Sang, who does a lot of the Tough Scout music, and um, uh, two non-musical people who did all the business, uh, uh, Mac and Eddie Joseph, and um, it, ju it just did really well. And then Acid Jazz licensed it and, and, and did a CD, because we, we didn't do CDs. They did a CD. We sold a lot of that record. Now, we must have sold over 10,000 of, of that. See, there's I'm like not, loads I'm of happy accidents. There's nothing mystical about it in the end, but you just like, no. oh, it's a legendary album. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I quite do like like the the haze, the mystical haze about stuff, you know. Yeah. But maybe you know, maybe Shaka in the end was really a simple guy, and then we all like, ah, uh, but yeah, we would have known his name and date of birth in the end, but we do not know it. So no. yeah, no. yeah. Talking about other artists, can you tell me about your relationship with uh, Earl Sixteen? Well, Earl had not that long moved to London from Jamaica maybe in 87 I think he, he came to London and um, that was that was through Jeremy that connection um, we had a sort of connection to Earl it was more difficult in those days to link with people because Before obviously the there wasn't social media so you know somehow you had to get somebody's phone number um, and um yeah we, we we had that we had that rhythm natural roots and um earl came and sang on it i remember it vividly the one take did one a couple of harmony tracks um and that was that but the the great thing about natural roots is that i think 
that it, it did help a little bit to kind of establish Earl in England. Um, and, uh, you know, after that, he, he, he became part of Dread Zone and he did the work with Left Field and, you know, um, and I still work, I still work together with Earl all the time. Um, we write a lot together. Uh, but it can be, it can be difficult, I think. You know, if you if you're in the sort of situation like Earl, where you're, you know, quite young, you're in Jamaica, you've had some records coming out, you're a sort of you know a name in Jamaica that's beginning to be known, and then you leave, and that that can be difficult. So um, yeah, I've I've always been um, very proud of Natural Roots, and um, and particularly proud of the. Uh, footage from Japan of Shaka going crazy to natural natural roots, which actually is probably yeah. I mean, you know, the, it, towards the end towards the end of his life, I mean, Shaka was not moving in the same way yeah, yeah, yeah. in dances, um, and he wasn't chanting either. He wasn't holding the mic in the same way. But that that footage from Fuji Rock Festival, Shaka playing, yeah, yeah, the Natural one that goes is, all around the internet, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> is 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 fantastic, yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, big up Shaka for supporting that record, and actually big up Shaka, as I said, for supporting, you know, all the good music. You know, Shaka support. He never, he never, I can't say, but he never felt any way about you know, about that, about supporting and bigging up the music. Yeah. I'll we try to kind of wrap it up here, make maybe a one or two questions and then see if somebody from the audience has something to add or say. Okay. I need courtesy of Lord Zoran over there, so the snake in Belgrade. Okay. What the fuck? <laughs> I mean, there's some guys from Belgrade here who are also yeah. burning to know that, so do elaborate. Well, I guess, I guess th so we're playing at the, the, there was the Echo Festival and it was, it was Manasa, Shaka. When was it? Sorry. I think it was 2003, I think. Heavy times in Serbia, mate. Yeah. Well, after, but yeah, yeah, yeah there yeah. was a lot of security at that festival, <laughs> paramilitary security. Um, we're just playing, me and, me and Brother Culture are on the stage, working, playing, it, working the crowd, mashing it up, and suddenly there's this great big snake on stage. Because it's an island in the in the in the in the in the river Danube, or do you say the Donau? Yeah, yeah, Donau. Yeah, Danube, yeah. Um, yeah, big island, but obviously you know, yeah, there's a snake. And um, but the funny thing was is that they, the security came to deal with the snake, and they took it away and they cooked it. <laughs> um, you heard it here, live yeah. in the Rex. Like they cooked it, but the problem the problem was is that I am terrified of snakes. I don't like snakes, and nobody told me that they had dealt with the snake that they'd taken it away. So all the rest of the session, <laughs> I'm looking through my records, thinking the fucking snake is just gonna peer, you know, like be right in my face. Anyway, um, and then it started raining, and then it was Shaka's time to play, and they had to hold lo lots of people stood behind Shaka holding umbrellas because they weren't ready for the rain. It's funny. That, that was a nice, a nice occasion. Yeah. It could be like, is this the last tune I'm ever gonna play? Like, yeah. snake's gonna bite. Uh, they said they said the snake was not poisonous. Yeah. After, I wouldn't. How would I know? <laughs> Amazing. <Yeah. laughs> Uh, anybody from the audience has maybe a question or two? We have like a few minutes left for one, two questions. Don't be shy. Seriously. Okay. Okay. Then I'm 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 gonna go, I'm gonna ask something that I just recently uh, yeah fell into my mind. I mean, uh, reggae being one of the few music genres that constantly like is a U culture oriented people, but the more the artist ages and the more it's older, the more his credibility grows instead vice versa, yeah. you know? And uh, I mean, yeah, Nick, you started young, you now, yeah, reaching some certain age and stuff. Um, what are your actually thoughts on that and like your reputation and the way you see and maybe, you know, I think I think yeah. there is there. I, I didn't verse it really good, so but no, I no, think I you got it telepathically. Like, yeah, I think um, 
yeah, I think that that thing certainly exists in the in the in the reggae thing that people respect long, longevity um, and history in the business. But I don't think it's unique to reggae at all. Yeah. I think it's the same in the particularly in, in American soul music um, that the elders. Uh, Venerated, I think it's true in 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 African music. Yeah, well, that's in African music. Me, like high life, yeah. you know. I'm thinking about Fela Kuti. Yeah, yeah. It was like more and more, you know, more and more important as he got older. I think, you know, to be honest, I think that is the natural human condition. And the 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 thing about the sort of you know the amazing new band and they're all 17 kind of thing. Actually, that is not so much the natural thing, yeah, man, yeah. you know. Um, you should have to, you should have to, uh, you know, to use an English phrase, earn your stripes, you know. Um, but I think, I also think it's a really good thing. And I think um, it's a nice thing as a producer. I know that um, it's a nice dynamic when you're working with, with kids who are like, you know, I'm 56. When I'm working with kids who are like 25, 30 or something, you know, that's a good vibe works it works well and i think i think that's always been understood very clearly in jamaica um you know i remember the 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 way king tubbies was with all the kids around him at the studio and stuff he, he was the daddy you know and people like that yeah yeah niceness i think we're gonna wrap it up here yeah let's have some music yeah thank yeah. you again nick thank you each and everyone over there and let's make it next. Uh, we're going forward with Escape the City Festival. Uh, this stage opens soon. Tonight we have Nick Manasseh here. We have Lions then over there. And yeah, a few more days of good sound system vibes and music. Yeah, Thank you all. Eh?